Welcome to another week of Gospel Project as we take these moments to look at Hebrews. Uh, really, we'll look at, at several passages from the book, but if you have your Bible there, turn to Hebrews 1. We'll begin in the first chapter. It's really been a joy to spend these uh, few months. I know uh, we've been disconnected over video, but I've enjoyed teaching these lessons uh, over these past, really, year at this point since we've been doing this, keeping folks connected to the Gospel Project. And I would while people aren't live, it's been a joy to hear from each of you as you've interacted and stayed connected with our church through uh, these Bible studies. But today we're going to be in Hebrews uh, chapter 1 and really work our way through a couple of different passages in the book looking at uh, Jesus. The, the book of Hebrews kind of has a general theme, and so what we're going to tackle today isn't really one passage. It's going to be kind of the main argument of the book of Hebrews really for those who were Jewish and seeing how their faith connected to Jesus, how Jesus fit into the puzzle. Uh, he wasn't um, coming to completely remove the whole puzzle. He was actually coming to be the crowning piece of the puzzle, that all of the puzzle of the Old Testament makes sense in Jesus. And so uh, for our time together, we'll look at this uh, passage from Hebrews 1 all the way I believe to Hebrews 10 at the end of our time. Uh, but, but I do want to ask you a question. And this is one over the years in ministry I've found there can be a fair bit of confusion on. And, and the question would be is, in the, in the Old Testament, how are people saved? If you were Moses or David or Abraham or any of these saints in the Old Testament that we would believe were, were one day going to see when we reach heaven, uh, how is it that they make it to heaven? You know, we're used to um, leading someone or hearing about leading somebody to faith in Christ today where you say, trust Jesus, repent of your sin, and believe on Jesus. Well, they, they didn't have that gospel that we think of today that they could share. So how is it that they were able to, to make it to heaven? Was it, was it by faith alone still? Was it by Jesus? Was it... Was it by sacrifices in the temple? Oftentimes that's the answer I hear, is that through the sacrifices at the temple, the payment of sin that happened through the blood of bulls and goats and rams, uh, that's what was pleasing to God, and those were what got them to heaven. Then it was as if God was like, well, that's okay. I just need something better. And then Jesus comes along, and then now that's the way people are saved. It's as if there's two different uh, ways in which people are saved. That, that's not the case. And I think that's what a lot of people uh, perceive it to be, but that's not exactly how people are saved in the Old Testament. And that's what Hebrews helps us to see and really helps us to see how Jesus is the puzzle that fixes it all. People are saved through faith in either a coming Messiah in the Old Testament or a Messiah that has come in the New Testament. So, if you will, we'll uh, begin, and I'll just kind of give you the first point, and then we'll start unpacking Hebrews 1. But the, fir the first thing I want you to see is that Jesus is the better revelation. He, we, he's the better um, revealing of God himself. So um, there are several great Christological Christ passages in the New Testament. Um, I've, always, there, I've always heard there's, there's kind of four main ones. You have you know, John chapter 1, where in the beginning was the Word. You have Philippians 2, where you have this servant who came as an example as he served his people. You have Colossians 1, uh, 15 through 20, where he is the image of the invisible God. And then you have Hebrews chapter 1 here uh, that, that talks about how Jesus is the better revelation. So if you have your Bible there, look in verse 1. It says, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, uh, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he created the world. So let's just pause there. I want to, before we read verse 3, pull out the comparisons. Look how verses 1 and 2 are structurally paralleling. And I would even say this. Uh, as you look at those two verses, uh, these will become thematic for the book. So let's just look at the parallel. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways. So this speaking about the Old Testament long ago, but then verse 2, look how it starts. But in these last days, um, so, so long ago at many times, but in these last days, those two connect. Notice here this next phrase, God spoke, 
And then notice down there it says, but he has spoken to us. So then God spoke in the past tense to our fathers by the prophets. Then verse 2. Now, God, he has spoken to us. Now, it's speaking of those here in the New Testament time by his son. So now you have the fathers are spoken to by the prophets and now spoken to by his son. So that's the distinction of, you want to say, what, how does the author of Hebrews begin? He begins by saying that there was a message given in the Old Testament to the church fathers there, but now we're hearing through Jesus, his son. But then he wants to talk about Jesus. He wants to tell exactly what, uh, what, who Jesus is. So look how he describes it. Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So, so notice he says he's going to receive the, all the riches. He's the heir of all things. But he's also, he goes all the way back and he says, he created the world, and as Colossians 1 will say, is through him, by him, and for him. So, so Christ was the acting agent. God is the planner, the power behind it all. But Christ, the acting agent in creation. And so God himself created through God the Son, uh, God the Father created through God the Son here, through him to create the world. So Jesus isn't the first creation. He is the creator. He's the one doing uh, the creating. And so when, when we look back, think about he's giving context here. When you look in the Old Testament, He's saying, no, I'm not talking about a prophet that has just arrived today. He's saying, when I talk about Jesus, I'm unlocking the whole Old Testament puzzle because he was there in the beginning. That's, that's why, you know, Genesis says, let us make man. This plural statement about God himself is that it's not just God the Father, it's God the Son and God the Spirit all in this action of creation. Verse 3. Let me say this before I say verse 3. That you notice that now he has spoken to us by his son. There is not another revelation that will follow this one. So we have the message from God to the fathers. We have the message in this time through the son. We're done at this point. So this is God's revelation to us. Verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This is a big a passage for how we understand Jesus. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Uh, Colossians will say he holds the universe together. Then he says, after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So after he's done his work of saving us, purifying us from our sins, which will be a priestly work, we'll talk about in a moment. But after he's done that, he sits down the right hand of the Father in heaven. Now, a couple of things. Uh, this says this phrase is the one I want to focus in on. Is he is of the exact imprint of his nature. They share the same nature, meaning that God Himself and the Son Himself, God the Father, God the Son, share the same nature. This is what drives our understanding of the Trinity and our understanding of the divinity. Of Jesus, we know he is his humanity, but here it's very clear that God Himself shares the exact same nature with God the Son, and so uh, we we can say in this moment there's this union uh, with Christ, with God and man found in Christ. They are of the same substance, and so since we've pulled this prophet of God, Jesus Christ who is God himself, now the writer of Hebrews wants to elevate him over the Old Testament in such a way to say, you know what, he wasn't just at the end that this prophet came along and he supersedes that. He's actually been there the whole time. He's a part of all of God's story all the way through. And the, the book of Hebrews in particular highlights this priestly office that Christ holds, that, that he stands in place for us. So again, we're asking the question, how are you saved in the Old Testament? Well, ultimately, by the high priest, uh, the ultimate high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the second thing I want you to see is Jesus is the better high priest. There have been priests before this. Jesus is the better high priest. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles there, flip, flip over to chapter 8. There's a lot of argument found in the middle here. We're going we're gonna to skip across, and sometimes there's good value in this, 
we're going to skip across some highlighted verses and pull together some themes of Hebrews. Uh, it's, it's good to do Bible study in the trees and looking at every verse by verse, word by word. That's a really good thing to do. Uh, but if you only bi do Bible study word by word, you might miss oftentimes the forest. You just see the individual trees. But, but a lot of times it's good to look at a book and say, okay, what's the overall argument that's happening in this book? So Hebrews 8 verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. So you imagine he started the book in the first couple of verses. He's been making this argument all the way through and he gets to, to, to chapter 8 verse 1. He says, okay, here's my point. The point is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heaven. See that connected right back. See the thematic word. He sat down at the right hand, the majesty on high. We have such a high priest one that's seated there, he's a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So, so what does he mean that there's a true tent set up, one that's not from man? Let's just keep reading. It'll explain the tent. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. So on earth there's this tent or tabernacle set up. And so he moves over to think, here's this high priest offering stuff in the temple. Now verse 4, now if he were on earth, Jesus, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. And so Old Testament, you think, there are these priests who are continually offering these gifts in the tent here on earth. But he says, why would Jesus not be the right one there? He's, and the reason, he says, is in verse 5. He said, they serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So this gives us a, a picture of exactly what's going on with the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. That, that we have a copy, a shadow, in a sense a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus and what he's going to do. But, but he's going to say, look here, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. He said that, listen, when you're on the mountain, you saw the actual uh, place in heaven where this ultimate sacrifice of Christ would pay for all sins. So you need to make a copy on earth so that people will then understand what it means to have a sacrifice for your sins. But as it is, verse 6, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So that's why we use the term better, because Hebrews use it, that Jesus is the better high priest. He is the one who now fulfills this for us. And the copies of the of the, the earthly things are the copies of the original of what's in heaven of where Jesus will be the ultimate sacrifice. He'll not only be the high priest, he'll be the one who is sacrificed. He is playing the role of the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God uh, to be sacrificed. So it's not just a role, it's, it's who he is. But in, the, in all of this, he is fulfilling the priest, the sacrifice, all of these offices as he does it. So that's why it's important for us to know Christ as high priest, as the priest who stands in our place, who is interceding on our behalf. So that's why even in the Old Testament, they would look to the high priest. It was only a picture of what Christ would ultimately be doing for them. When the, when the high priest was offering sacrifices on their behalf, the same way Christ one day would be offering himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. And so the same way he did it for them. So when they trust that sacrifice, they're trusting the copy of the heavenly thing. That, that's the distinction here, is that the Old Testament was a shadow and a copy so that people could believe in the coming Messiah. They could see there would be one day one who would come and forgive their sins and pay for their sins in being sacrificed, the ultimate high priest. Now, uh, let's carry it one step further. The, the third point of all this is that Jesus is the better sacrifice. I've already talked about the idea of the sacrifice. He's the high priest. Let's look at Hebrews 10. So flip over a couple more chapters with me. We'll look at verse 11. Every high priest, priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which, notice what the Bible says here, can never take away sins. So just to be clear here, you say, well, in the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices and it took away their sins. Well, it did not. Hebrews, right here, verse 10, verse, chapter 10, verse 11, says these will never 
take away sins. So these daily sacrifices being offered over and over again with the purpose to try to take away their sins. But then look what Christ does. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool at his feet. For by a single offering, just one offering himself, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And so his point is that the high priest here would have to continually go offer sacrifices and then go get another sacrifice and come back again and again and again, all pointing to that there will be one one day who will offer and, and he'll be done. And, and here the author of Hebrews says, I'm going to put this sacrifice, Jesus offers this sacrifice, then he goes and sits down. It, it, it's this sense when he sits down at the, the right hand of the majesty on high, as he sits there, he... He's done. Like you are after a long day's work and you get to the house and you've had dinner and then there's the couch and you, you sit down. The work is done. And it's the same way Jesus is here. He, he's done. He's not, get back, he's not gonna get back up and offer again another sacrifice. The, the penalty has been paid for sin and it's all found in Jesus. And so everybody in the, the, the Old Testament would ultimately have their sins covered by Jesus. They trusted in the coming Messiah. And ultimately for us today, we have our sins covered by the, the Son who did come and pay for our sins. Now, let me just offer this one word of encouragement. There's not been a ton of application here we've done. We've done more of an understanding of salvation, Old Testament, New Testament, and Jesus. But one encouragement I would give to you today is that, that Jesus has paid for your sin once and for all. And so if you're a Christian, if you have repented of your sin and you believed on the Lord Jesus, you don't have to wake up every day thinking somebody now has to pay for this sin again. Even, even, let me, let me carry this through for you. Even when God disciplines you for your sin as a Christian, so there'll be times that you will fall into sin as a Christian and the Lord will discipline you. That's actually not God's punishment. Oh, oh, you're not receiving the punishment for your sin. Even as a Christian, you're receiving the discipline of the Lord. Because if God truly punished you, you'd go to hell. You would be cast away from him forever. He would never hear a word that you said. The punishment only falls on those who are outside of Christ. So when you wake up today and maybe you struggle and have a sin in your life, and you feel like God's punishing me because I'm sinning. No. This is punishment. That's already set on Christ. So, so don't think the punishment's on you because all of it, all the payment for your sin has happened to Christ. But for me and you, as followers of Christ, we just face the discipline of a loving Father trying to correct our hearts, turn them from the world, and turn them to Christ. So be encouraged today. You wake up in the love of Christ who has paid for all of your sins and you, you obey him not out of fear of punishment but out of joy knowing that that's a gift from the Lord that you can follow him and knowing that any sort of discipline in your life is as Hebrews will say is because he loves you. Those he disciplines are those he loves. It's the same way it works with my children. And I see them, you know, growing up, if you're a child, you, you think your parents discipline you because it's somehow enjoyable. But discipline takes work as a parent. You get tired of it. You just want to sit down. I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight my kids about trying to do all the things they need to do. But in order to correct them, and in order for them to be uh, godly people, in order for them to understand right and wrong, in order for me to raise them in the right way, the work of discipline 
it only comes out of a genuine love to see them be godly people. So discipline equals love. So, so you don't face the punishment because we have a high priest who once and for all offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And in not just the copies of things here on earth, but in the heavenly places, your sins have been paid for in the blood of Christ. Be encouraged today by the work of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ, what he means to us. And Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged today by the grace and the mercy found in his work. And may you use it to strengthen our uh, walk with you. Give us great joy in obeying you and help us to know the love you have for us found in Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.